Well, hello, my friends. It tells me that I'm live. Okay, let me get a little bit more light here. Ah, a little bit more light. I should always do that. I'm always late, aren't I? I'm always thinking about doing things, what I should do now, later. Uh, I know I usually wait two or three days before I do a live, but I thought that I'd do one now because I have it readily, steadily on my mind, and I want to talk about it. Teaching. How do we teach others? And um, are we serious about how we teach other people? I'll put my water over here, and since I'm on live, I'll take my time. How do, how do you teach others? I know how I teach others. I know why I teach others. I know what my teaching others is all about. Um, how do you handle that? Are you seriously concerned about what you teach others in the life that you're now living? Are you concerned about how you influence others? How you teach others. Now, tell you why I'm having this conversation with you. A friend of mine contacted me from Canada and he asked me a question about uh, the gay community, uh, kind of like teaching things that can destroy homes and children and lives. And uh, I, told him that I wanted to discuss it with him. And I said, no, of course, the gay community doesn't do that. But in every community of man, there are people that are poor representatives of individuals when it comes to teaching other individuals. There are certain people, I will say, that ought not be allowed to influence children because their behavior is ridiculous. Now, I know that there are people that are not gay, uh, it just and so that we can save some time, there are people that are straight and there are people that are gay, straight, gay. We'll keep it that way so that I won't have to be mentioning LGBT and Q and all of that. All of us have our opinions. And all of us believes, if we're adults, that our opinion is truer than everyone else's opinion. And when I woke up this morning, human beings were still in the process of attempting to teach other human beings or to persuade those other human beings that their way was the most appropriate way to live. How do we teach others? Well, I like to teach by example and precept. I want to apologize for um, the last webcast that I did, if some of you were offended by my messy hair, by my thinking, by my mannerisms, I go through these cycles sometimes. I don't feel like I'm radio sharp all the time. I go through those cycles. I wanted you to see me going through that cycle. Have you ever seen your granddad or your grandmom just get fed up with everything and don't want to be... That was me. I don't try to put on airs like I'm Superman. I'm not Superman. Sometimes I don't feel like engaging. I didn't feel like engaging. I got invited to um, two events yesterday. And they were marvelous things. With people all around. I could have been outside, but I didn't go. Why didn't I go? Because I didn't want to be around people. 
I didn't want to be around food. I didn't want to be around drink. I didn't want to be around anybody. I wanted to be alone thinking about this planet, this world that I live on. And so I thought that I'd do a webcast today because I feel much better than yesterday. If you don't like the webcast yesterday, I apologize. I hope that you like the one today. I won't give you the details, but I got a phone call today. And that because I'm I'm still ordained to do weddings. And I got a dear young man is getting ready to get married for the first time. It's going to be out of the beach somewhere. And he said he could have had any other person to do the ceremony, but he said, I want PJ to do it. Mm. And I'm looking forward to that. I'll speak to them both and find out what their wishes are and to comply with their wishes. I am just elated. And that's the term that I want to use. I am just elated at my ability to teach um, and to primarily teach by his example and precept. Something weird happened around my home today. You know, over the past couple of years, I've done some, um, well, I painted my house. I plan to put new windows in all the way around, but I'm putting windows in at a time. And because I, you know, I want to live till I'm 100. I don't plan on going anywhere. Um, I don't plan on falling ill and passing away. That's not my, um, that's not my modus operandi. I don't like doing that. Um, so I'll make these improvements, you see. I'll make these improvements. Let me do something because I'm working with another computer here. And uh, there we go. And so what I want to do is I want to, you know, just admonish you and teach you. That's why this one is called the spirit of teaching. All right. Like I said, you teach with every beat of your heart. The way that we advance towards a greater and, and making each other greater and better is that we teach them. We teach them. You're teaching. Now, I want to talk to my community, just like I spoke with my community when I was in the in the church. Now, I want to speak with my community. You teach by your example and your precept. Who would want to listen to a person? I've already apologized for yesterday's cast. Who would want to listen to a person that is raggedy? Now, you see what I'm doing? Brothers, sisters, non-binary or whatever. <laughs> I don't understand some of these new phrases that they're using these days. I really don't. But um, I get a big kick out of grooming myself and keeping myself presentable because I am a public figure. Okay, number one, I teach by precept and example. I try to keep shaved. I try to keep this trim nice. Uh, I don't put anything on my face, nothing on my face. My face is who I am. Uh, I don't use oils and creams and and things to take bumps off and stuff like that. Uh, I have my hair. 
all of it, except for a balding spot in the back there, because you know I lie down there. But you know why I have my hair? I've never dyed my hair. I've never put peroxide or any of that junk. Or My wife put some relaxer in my hair once to give it a curl. But I told her, no, you're not going to put any more of that in my hair because it makes your hair fall out. And when you look at older people, that's why they're bald headed because they put peroxide, acid, and things in their head, and you're damaging the top of your skull. I'm teaching you the benefit of teaching. You should listen to an elder. I've never dyed or whacked my hair like that. Therefore, I have a head full of hair. Some people go bald because it's hereditary, and that's all right. You know, if, uh, you know, they say that when you're born, you're born with cow legs, these little things that, uh, you know, you got these, oh, it goes all the way back in your hair. I'm teaching you something. Stop putting that mess in your hair. Let your natural hair grow out. This is my natural. This is not a wig. And it's, I haven't had a haircut since March of, no, I think it was February 2018. I haven't been to a barber shop. No, I cut, I have a little pair of clippers. I <clears throat> do that. But I did not frequent a barber's shop and give him 30 and $40 to snip my hair. I do my own. I'm trying to teach you something. I want to teach you something. Something occurred around my house today. My caregiver, that's what I call him. My caregiver said, did you see that person that came to the door? I said, nobody came to the door. No, but they came down the driveway, John, and they came to the back gate, and this person said, I said, what do you want? And the person said, oh, I'm sorry. And they, and I said, well, who was it? He said that it was a female. She was thin, and she was going to come back until she saw me. And when she saw me, she left. Well, I don't know who the person was because I didn't see them. And my ring that you just heard didn't because she came down the driveway. I don't know who it was, but it had to be somebody that was hanging around one of these boys years ago. And all these guys have gone on with their lives and doing wonderful in their lives. And uh, what I'm thinking is that she remembered this place, but she was walking. She had to be walking, and she had to come back. And since I've remodeled and changed everything, she wasn't quite sure whether I was still here. That's why she didn't come to the front door, I'm assuming. And so she was trying to look down to see because the garage is where a lot of the young men stayed and and were acting unseemingly. And I had to stop their girlfriends from coming by here seeing them <laughs> because problems start. Trouble starts. I'm teaching. I'm teaching. I'm forever teaching. I think that all of us are forever teaching. When you come to my website, you see these clips all up and down. And I want to teach you something as I review what some of these things are on my website when you go to it or when you 
go to my YouTube live page. Because when you go to my YouTube live page, YouTube, man, whoever works their websites have it all figured out beautifully. Well, my website, johnecoleman.org, is one page all the way down. And I'm on it now on another computer behind my laptop. And I'm scrolling down. And I, I just want to share with you, of course, on teaching will be at the top when this is up. But when you go to www.johnecoleman.org, you come upon my website, which is called an independent thinker with good reason. See, when the church men start kicking me around and, and I'm teaching this beautiful exegete word of God, I mean, I had the smartest young African-American males that were smart in Bible came and joined the church that I pastored. <laughs> I put pride in teaching my brothers and sisters that study theology with me. I'm not like these pimps out there today. I don't know what they're doing in these churches. You go to these churches and these people look like they're crazy. They get up, they say the craziest thing. They don't use the book. Wait a minute. Let me. I'm teaching you something. So let me teach you something. I'll roll back because I don't want to get up and turn my back on you and walk away. But I want to show you something because I'm teaching you something. See? And that's what's good. I'm going to show you. For those of you that don't know, John Coleman. This was my preaching Bible, the brown one. All right? This was my family Bible. I call it the love story. Uh, I have some other ones here. I have a lot of ones here. Uh, I have three. Wait a minute. I'm teaching you something. Four. Where is the fifth one that I taught from? You talking about somebody that used a Bible. I don't want to look at it and then look right over it. I want to make sure, but here we go. Oh, these are four of the classic books that I've used, and I still have whatnots in there. I call them whatnots because they're pages of something. And the teacher says, no, I'm not going to preach to you. I'm not going to preach a Bible lesson to you. I'm not going to do that. The old man spent all these years in this house. Ooh. Since 1974, I've been in this house. Since 1974, I've stepped in this room. I'm teaching you something. Because you youngsters, you got to get used to settling down. Settling down is very important. Because if you never get used to settling down, you will never know how to survive. I'm looking for that other one because I had it. Oh, there it is. There it is. I knew I had it. I knew I had it. It was hidden behind another book. It was my old Thompson chain reference. Yeah, let's stack them up here. Now, through all the years, <laughs> I love this. I'm teaching you something. I'm teaching you something. Hang in there. Chill out. You can write a comment and leave it if you want to. I hope you can. I hope I set it up like that. But I'm teaching you something. That's very important. Let me start with the Thompson. No. Let me start with the. Ah. 
Let me start with my family one here. This is the family one. I call it love story. Of course, the front cover is gone. This was the Bible that my uh, my mother died when I was 12. My daddy gave me this Bible. Um, um, and see, when did it happen? Yes, he gave me the Bible and he said, John Jr., you look like you're going to be the smartest of them all. You keep the family Bible. So I did. All right, we're going to open this thing up. Wait a minute. Am I doing it right? Yeah, here we go. Oh, this thing is old. Presented to Marianne Coleman from Nanny Coleman on July 22nd, 1945. I was born February the 8th, 1944. That's the handwriting by my grandmother, Nanny Ali Coleman. Mm. This was the family Bible. Of course, it was the King James Version. There were no other versions there. And <laughs> this, let me see if I have anything underlined in here. I'm going to the New Testament. Oh, this is something. I says, one of the two ordinances of the real church. Let me see what I have written here. See, I have it written right along. It's written right along the column there. Because when you have a family Bible or something like that, uh, it's a thing that you hold to. I'm teaching you something. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, what do these verses say? I'm curious because I haven't read this. Did I write this? I think I did. My handwriting was much better. It says, And he took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And I wrote in the column of my Bible, this is one of the two ordinances of the church. So the first ordinance of the church is that if you were a true Christian, you participated in the sacrament or the Holy Communion. Christians all over the world do that. Christians in all denominations do that. Um, I believe that you should only have to do it one time. Because if you have a strong mind, you know that you're going to always believe in God. And every time I eat, I do that in remembrance of God. So this is just beautiful that I... Oh, wait a minute. There's something else here. Talking about history. I'm teaching you something. Just, 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 just follow along. Let me put some more light on this subject. Yeah, we need a little bit more light. Now, on this inside flap, it says, John Wesley Coleman of Los Angeles, California. I can't read it. It's washed off, but it says, Holy Matrimony. Los Angeles, California, 4300 Hooper Street. This is the date that my, ah, yeah. Okay, that my dad and mom got married in, in May 
1941. They got married in May of 1941, and I was born in February of 1944. Wow. I have the record here. Oh, you're going to love this one. You're going to love this one. Now, this, these are the list of the children that were born unto Marianne Coleman, ex Marianne Guyton. Let's see. Children's names Eleanor Diane Coleman. That's my older sister. March 9th, 1942. Then John Edwin Coleman, that's me, born February 8th, 1944. I'm teaching you something. Hang around. I'm teaching you something. Ross Allen Coleman, born May 10th, 1946. Donna Jean Coleman, born, I think that's May 7th, 1948, and Bradford Clay Coleman, born September 14th, 1953. Those were all the children of my mother, except for one more child. Want to get the record straight, I'm teaching you something. I love this YouTube, because you can put your history down here, people. You can put your history on this. I've never written a book. I don't want to write a book. I don't need a commemoration for me. Just play this clip. You know everything about John Coleman. He lived on this beautiful planet. He lived his life, and he enjoyed every moment of it. The deaths was a baby boy, boy that was born on August the 7th, 1954, to Mary Ann, and the baby boy that was born died 17 minutes after birth. And then, of course, the death of my mother, Mary Ann Coleman, September the 10th, 1956. I was 12 years old when mommy passed away. In this here family Bible that I love looking at, this is the old King James Version, tiny words. You can see some of the marks and the columns there. This was a love story. And this should be passed on to one of my daughters. Should be passed on to one of my daughters as a family heirloom, a family Bible. It's very important. Now, when I first became a Christian, let me see what I wrote in this. One. Teaching you something. Open up the front cover of the Bible. This is the way. <laughs> Person's Bible. Look, I got phone numbers, names, everything in this sucker here. Everything in here. Notes. I haven't looked in this. My goodness. Oh, I got my lifelong friend, Donald Ross. He wrote his name and his number here. And he lived in 711 and a half West. 84th Street,
I can't read the rest. They got Judy Reynolds' name, Pink Art. My goodness, I got this Bible on April the 16th, 1977. I was in this house when I bought it. Oh my goodness. All these notes and on the second page, Look what I have. Let me show you something. See, that Jesus is the star of my life. Everything. I mean, I'm just, do you ever do that? Just look at all this. Now, this book I use. I have verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1 detailed here. Let me read it for you. See why I had it documented or underscored like that. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I don't know why I underlined that, but it must have intrigued me because I've always been moved by uh, things like that, the Spirit of the living God and all of that. I've always... this was my Thompson chain reference. If you know anything about a Bible, uh, on the column of the Thompson chain reference Bible, you can see it. It had notes. It had hermeneutical uh, and uh, kinetical notes that you can turn to. This was one of the finest Bibles ever printed. Uh, it, it was just, I'm just flipping through it. And I use this one because I got, look, practically any page I go to, notes all through it. This is in the 70s, the 70s and the 80s, I used this Bible. I mean, almost every page that I turn to, the book of Psalms, all throughout the, look at that, the book of Psalms full of adenums in there. I'm teaching you something. I'm teaching you something. Don't let don't let anyone fool you and tell you that because I came out gay that I didn't still love God and attend to his words. I got history behind me, brothers and sisters. I love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength. With all my being, I would never cheat God's people. I would never try to take advantage of them. Uh, I use these words to encourage them and hopefully that their life would be encouraged uh, as mine is encouraging. Never to use them. I see some of these preachers these days, they aren't teaching you diddly squat about anything. Got you jumping up and down in that place falling all over the place, twerking in the middle of the sanctuary floor. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you that may have thought I was drunk yesterday, I want to read something to you from the book of Proverbs. I have it marked right here. And I still believe in what I have marked. Listen to what it says. You know, I, I want to put on my bifocal glasses because I'm reading from the text and my eyes are, ah, 
Yeah, okay. My, much better. Listen to this. For those of you that have a problem with alcoholism and you got to go to a 20-step program, I got this for you. Listen to me. It says, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wines. All right. Now, he's not He's not telling you not to drink. He's saying if you spend too much time at it, okay? He says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, and when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Right. And the last verse says, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You know what he was saying? He was saying, <laughs> if you're drunk, you just going to keep on getting drunk every time you get a chance to get drunk because you were drunk and the drunk did it to you. It's going to make you look at people. It's going to make you look at uh, children and think things that you shouldn't think. It's going to make you look at men and women and make you utter things that you shouldn't. That's why they got jails. That's why they have laws to lock people up. I'm gay, but I'm not going to break the law. Okay, get that right through your head, right quick. I may be gay, but I'm not going to be breaking no law. I love it. I have all this, almost every page that I turn to. Oh my goodness, I like this one from Ezekiel chapter three. He says right here, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way, uh, to save his life. That same man, I love this, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, and thou hast delivered thy soul. You know what that says? <coughs> <coughs> this verse says that if I see from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 13, I'm sorry, verses 18 and 19, it says that if I see somebody that's headed down the path of destruction. And I don't tell them. And I pat them on the back. Oh, you're going to be all right. Everybody do that. You're going to be all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. God says, when that wicked person dies, his blood is going to be required at your hand because you gave him a false narrative. PJ. See that PJ? That stands for Pastor John. I was ordained a minister of God. If I see you going down the dark path, I'm going to tell you. Going down the dark path is not marrying the same sex. If you love somebody strong enough that you want to marry that person, and be with that person. And I'm not thinking about what happens in the bedroom. Because in the book of Hebrew. 
in one of them Bible, in all them Bibles, it says marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. So I don't care who you marry, because it's not a defiling act. Now, if you grow up in a society that tells you you only need to marry a woman, what if you ain't never fell in love with a woman? What if you what if you more inclined to you fell for a guy? I'm just well, Pastor John, you fell for a loving uh a woman and you fell in love with that woman. Yes, I did. Well, how come you didn't marry a man? You couldn't marry a man then. So you telling me, Pastor John, that if you could have married a man back there, if the laws were the way they were today and freedom was being lived, you mean to tell me, Pastor John, that if, you, if I had met the man that I fell in love with and I knew I wanted to be with that man, I would have been with him. No, I wouldn't have had any offspring. Of course not. You can't do that. I wanted offspring. I just didn't know how to make them. I had to be taught. Listen, I'm teaching you a lesson. I'm teaching you a lesson. Because some of you are having too much of a headache about all these LGBT people like me. I don't understand it. You're not supposed to understand it. Live your life or your lie. Live it. Let me live my life or my lie. Do I look happy to you? Oh, yeah. This Thompson Chain reference was, let me skip to the new T over here. Mmm. Nothing but notes in this one. You know what? Many listen, listen, listen to this verse. Luke chapter seven, verse thirty seven. Of what nature I I have written. I want you to watch it. Look at that. I'm saying of what nature of repentance is this verse? And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now, it doesn't say what kind of sin she did. But she was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her hair and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. That's the way I feel when I feel about Jesus and God. Do you? And I'm gay. Now, what manner of repentance was that? I don't know what her sin was. I don't know. You know, a lot of people, a lot of preachers say, well, she was a whore. It doesn't say that. The text didn't say that. It says that she was a sinner. I don't know how she sinned. What is sin? If you were a student of mine, I'm teaching you something. Listen to me. What was sin? What sin did this woman commit? doesn't say that she was a great sinner. doesn't say 
She was a prostitute. Doesn't say that she beat her children. Doesn't say that she stole any money. She said that she was a sinner. She was one that lived outside of the restraints of God. Now, let me give you origin's definition of sin. And then you would, because a lot of these crazy evangelicals still watch me. And they're trying to see if, you know, that they probably all said, oh, John is anathema. You know what? You know where I'm from. You know what I say back at you. I know who's anathema. I'm not anathema. I love God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't still have all these wonderful books uh, in my library if I didn't love God. Yeah, let me move this over here. I want you to see, I have books and I love God. But what sin did this woman commit? You gonna guess it up? A lot of preachers, when they preach this in this book, and that's what they've done to a lot of my friends in the LGBT community. They whoop you down with this book. I'm teaching you something. Listen to me. I'm not going to short play this. This book has been a book of life for literally millions of people from this planet for decades and decades and decades and decades. This is no funny book. This is no book put together by some white racist to try to trick black or brown skinned people. In practically every country on the planet, at least on every continent, they have this book, it's a manner of book. I have all these around me because I'm a cleric. That's why someone asked me to perform a wedding for them next month. Because I use this book. And I'm bringing the people together under God. Because most people I know still believe in God. And they don't believe in some of these crazy butt preachers out here, which I don't blame them. Because these preachers have gone mad. Money whores. I can't believe some of these people. <clears throat> I've watched many of you over the years make them millionaires. They come up with some of the craziest stuff. And I got to tell you, if you really want to listen to a man that has a sound voice in that, because he snapped to his, his senses too. Carlton Pearson, he has a YouTube show. I watch Carlton at times. Charlton Pearson, Carlton Pearson, that's his name. Listen, I'm teaching you something. You don't know what that woman did. I'm just flipping the Bible and trying to find some pages that has something on. Here's some more yellow written in it. Let me see what I have underlined. Okay. John 15 and 1. This was one of my favorite verses, and I used to love to preach from this. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now, let's stop right here. Why did he say true? Because there's false representatives of the vine out there. And the vine has to be connected to the life source. He says, and these are the words of Jesus. They're in red in my Bible. Don't let that fear frighten you. See, people use this Bible wrongfully. They taught you wrongfully. And if you get, you still need God. Oh, yes, you do. 
And I'm going to tell you, when things get rough for me, and not like I'm scared because I'm not afraid to die. Uh, if I get hungry, I'd, I'd go next door and, and ask my Hispanic neighbors, you know what, I ran on hard times. I love you all and everything, but I need some food. Can you give me a can of beans or something? I'm not too proud that I want to ask for food. And if it ever gets like that, that's why not one man has ever come to my door. And I turned him away. Did I ever tell you guys a story? Lucy and I had gotten married and we were living at 43, 4321, 4321, Santa Rosalia Drive. We lived in an apartment there. <clears throat> we stayed in one of those apartment complex. All right. We had a nice little apartment. And it was a Saturday, summertime, a day that looked just like this. Sunny and nice outside. And I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to show you the way it looks outside. This is outside. You see my Juneteenth black pine. Sun is out. It's a sunny day in Los Angeles. Isn't that beautiful? It looked just like this. Just like this on that day. And I was in the kitchen, and this guy came up to the back porch, and I was going to eat. A meatloaf sandwich that I saved from last night for lunch. Yeah, Lucy and the girls had walked down to the shopping center, which is still there. They call it the Crenshaw Mall. Well, before it was the Crenshaw Mall, it was Vons Market, Woolworths. You can find some of the old pictures of it. So Lucy and the girls. She, Leslie, I think, was in the stroller. And Delia was walking. And Lucy walked him down there. I stayed home and I said, ooh, this really happened. I said, I'm going to eat this sandwich. Ooh, we, and I was hungry. Lucy made the best meatloafs. Mm. This guy came to the back door. We had a screen on our door. It was one of those apartments where you have back door and your neighbor had a back door. Her name was Ethel County. County. She was a senior citizen, about 80 something years old. She stayed on the other side. Well, this young man, he couldn't have been a day over 30. He was black. And he didn't have any. And he came and he tapped on the back door. I said, yeah, what can I do for you? Because you could walk from the driveway right up to the back door. And he said, oh, sir, I'm very hungry. I wonder if you have anything. I'm just hungry. And I looked at him and he was a brother. I said, oh yes. I'm teaching you something. 
I said, oh, yes, I have a most delicious meatloaf sandwich that my wife prepared. And I was going to have it for lunch. Let me go get it. And I just turned around in the kitchen to reach it, to turn it, to give it to him, and he was gone. You hear me? He was gone. In a split second, he was He was gone. I don't swear, you know, I don't swear on my mother's grave and on my mama and all that stuff. I don't do that. But that really happened. And I went down the steps and went down to the driveway where you get to the main driveway to get to Santa Rosa, Santa Rosalia Drive to look around for him. He said, man, I got the food here. And he was gone. It was as if he was there, and there's a scripture in the Bible that says, be careful how you entertain strangers because you may be entertaining angels and you're unaware of it. That's in this book here. And I experienced that. I'm a gay man. I'm queer. You can call me all the names you want to. But God revealed himself to me, and he reveals himself to every person. Whether you're queer, straight, crooked, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, and T, U, V, W, X, and Y, and Z, Whatever kind of human being you are, God loves you. He loves your voice. When you youngsters out there tripping because these parents are driving you crazy. I remember once it was a man, he was going crazy in his parents' house. I drove to another city. Drove out there, called him and said, I'm out here. I said, bring everything you have. He came out. I got him out of there and I said, now you live your life. They were suffocating him with these rules that meant nothing. Did not consider him. Well, I had to straighten the boy out. Because I teach by precept, and example. All right. Prove a point. Why did Jesus have to die? Here's a verse that tells me. And I underlined it. You can freeze it on your screen and read it if you want to. I underlined it. That's what I love about YouTube, because you can freeze a picture and read the content of what's there. And you won't be befuddled by stuff. See, a lot of people are befuddled because they've never picked up a book. They get confused by the book. It's a very easy tool to use. But in John, the book of John, chapter 15, no, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. The words of Jesus, it is expedient for you that I go away. Jesus was saying, it's necessary for me to let them kill me. I got to die. 
And then he says, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come. In other words, he says, see, I can't be here to talk to you, to hold you, to protect you, to encourage you, because I'm in this human body. But if I go away, look what he says. But if I depart, I will send him, that's the comforter that he was talking about, unto you. See, I still have him as my comforter. He comforts me. Death doesn't fear me. Life doesn't fear me. Life challenges me. Death is promised to this body, but life is mine forever. And when he has come talking about this comforter, he will reprove the world of sin. In other words, he's he'll be the one that'll give the payback for the people doing all the dirty work. And of righteousness. In other words, he will define what's right and wrong. And of judgment. And he will bring the right judgment on the persons at the right time. I got to say this. I knew a well-known preacher. He's well-known all over the world. Well-known in my city. Uh, and I knew him. And uh, I tried to tell him over and over again that what he was teaching was wrong and that he needs to stop teaching the people that trash. He was teaching people trashy stuff. And he bragged about him having the power to choose the day that he would die. And that he can choose long life or short life. I remember he there's a lot of controversy in his church because people was going to the doctor and he would even tell them, if you have faith in God, you throw your medicine out and stop listening to that doctor and have faith. That's what word faith doctrine taught. I was coming on the radio, breaking my back. Trying to. Kaylin Mitchell. Oh my. Okay, wait a minute. I'm about an hour into a webcast right now. So, uh, to, okay, call me back in 30 minutes. All right, bye bye. Yeah. Let's see. That's right. Call me back in 30 minutes. But anyway, he did that. And this person is has died. And my sorrow and grief for the family that lost him because they loved him. But he was a crooked preacher. Everything, practically everything he taught from his thing over there was crooked. I'm I'm teaching you something. Give me a minute. No, I'm not going to mention his name. You know his name. And he got rich off of lying on these books. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I don't care if you don't believe that these books are canonical. <laughs> I don't care how much money you got. I'm going to warn you right now. When you lie on this book, see, this book didn't say that homosexuals are all going to hell. This book didn't say that. Men said that. Because the God that loves me, that is a comforter in my heart, is still comforting me and has given me the know-with-all to know right from wrong. I do not practice debauchery. I do not do that. You know who practices debauchery? Someone that would have someone on his staff 
that would molest his own children. And then when that person goes to prison, the preacher is sending him money and saying he just lost his way. No, he didn't lo lose his way. That man was a great sinner. And the man that protects his sin by molesting his child is a great sinner. Don't play with me and don't play with this book. And I will not mention anyone's name. I don't have to mention their names. I don't have to. And you know why I don't have to mention? You know their names. You know what they're doing out there. You know what they've been doing. And they're doing it by standing behind a Bible. I got all these Bibles. That's what I've been talking about. I got all these Bibles. Let me put them here in my home that I'm taking you through that I've studied over the year. Here's another one. I never lied to you. Never tried to get money out of you. Trickery. Oh, I just opened up this one. Now, this is one of my Bibles. Which one was this? I bought this one on this day of October, 1993. I bought it because my preaching Bible was getting too much work. <laughs> That's what I wrote. And it's a new American standard. But look what I found in it. I want to show you guys something. I chanced upon a jewel. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> this is a dot matrix sermon. Do I have the date on here? Yes. July 2008. Can you see that? Jesus, the Delegator, taken from Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Have you ever been intimidated by those who claim to have this power of God in their lives by means of supernatural powers? Oh, you have if you've been looking at a certain TV network. Then I ask, have you ever wondered why they, uh, where they derive their teachings or their understanding of this simplified claim? You should have asked, why are they tricking you? Then I ask a third question. Today's message shall provide for us a vital insight into the proper use of the believer's delegated authority. And then I says, we shall aim at the following. And then I wrote at the top of it, what are we supposed to be doing? This was, and I usually did that after the sermon was printed on the printer and highlighted. Well, when I got to the sanctuary, to the church, I looked at my outline while the choir was singing a song because I was going to have to get up and preach. And so I was looking at it to see whether I had everything straight. And I said, uh, what are we supposed to be doing? I was trying to get them to retain their own personal beliefs before we begin our close look at the word of God. In other words, I was telling the congregation, maintain your belief. Know what's in you to believe. Don't let me stand up here and sugarcoat your life with my opinion about something. I'm going to show you how Jesus delegated authority from the word of God. And if you wanted to follow, let me set this down for a second. Then you would have to turn to Luke chapter 9. I'm going to use this very Bible that I got the sermon out of. Let me see if I can still find it. And you know, I didn't use this one very much. I didn't use it very much because I liked my old preaching Bible. You know, preachers like their old preaching Bible. And this was 
There it is. Okay. I got it. And I must not have preached from this book because there's no markings in it. But if I preach from this brown one here, let me go to Luke 9 and see if I've written all in this. Oh, I'm enjoying this. I'm teaching you something. I'm teaching you how it's how it comes together. I'm teaching you something. Pay attention. All right. Luke chapter 9. What verses? Oh, because I had to be preaching out of this one when I did it. No, this Luke chapter 10, verses 10 through 30. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 10. Oh. Yeah. I got 19 and 20 underlined there. That's what I did. Let me give you something else. Some more of these gems. See, Pastor John is, isn't preaching behind the pulpit. Pastor John, I don't I don't desire to. I'm 79. That's why most of my stuff is on my YouTube page. You want to hear some good, solid, biblical preaching? Look at me on my YouTube page and look at my preaching and teaching. I never lied to you. I told you the truth. That's all I did was tell you the truth. And I told you when I was on the radio, these crooks were out there to get your money and to mess up your lives. And God is killing them one by one. Man, it, hey, don't worry about these guys buying all these jets and all this stuff. I remember, oh, my God, who was that preacher that had all those boys? He was gay, but he took his homosexuality to the end course. Uh, Eddie Long, he's dead now. Eddie, man, all that money he had coming in that church, all those people, and then those boys he took with him to hotels, to other countries, and all that stuff. He was using them boys up sexually. That was wrong. God, I never did any, oh, oh, my God. One of the MacArthurites accused me of doing that, but he was out of his mind. No, brother, I don't, I don't roll that way. I don't roll that way. That is abomination, man. You don't do that. I don't care whether you straight, gay, or anything. Anytime a man of God, a preacher, uh, handles some people sexually, and hides behind that pulpit. <clears throat> if you know any of these preachers now, and don't make him right because he's uh, 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 fooling around with a woman, it's disgusting. Let me get back to my outline. I'm happy that I found this. See, I'm teaching you something. You can leave the church, but don't leave God. That's what I'm trying to teach you. Oh, yeah, you can leave the church, but don't leave God. Yeah, you can leave the Bible study group because there's a lot of funneling going on there and you don't want anybody touching you. Leave that. But if y'all like to do that in your Bible study group, make sure you're hugging the brother or the sister or the uh, a Q or the X or whatever that you're hugging them in love and not disrespecting them. I can't stand a pimp preacher. I can't stand him. I never could stand him. When I was on the radio preaching against him, I couldn't stand him. Now, why would I become a pimp? See, and I'm putting these things up on YouTube because they're going to talk about me when I'm, when I'm dead. They're going to talk about me like a dirty dog. They're going to try to find some junk on me. I didn't do that. I remember a preacher friend of mine. He still is. No, wait a minute. After Lucy died, preacher friend of mine, he's still alive. And if he watches this, he knows who he is. I'm not going to give his name. He said, well, John, Lucy's dead and everything. I know how it is. But if you're going to do something, 
leave town. Don't do it here. Just leave town. You can do whatever you want to do because if you do it here, you and I looked at that man and I said, what? Oh, don't oh, rid me from these whorish preachers, these whorish clerics. Rid me from them. And don't come flirting with me, flirting with me, and then I kiss you, and then you try to turn me in to the spiritual police. Get out of my face. You are allowed to change your point as the Holy Spirit of Christ assists you in a clear understanding of the word of God. I read that. See, I told the congregation, you can change the way you feel about everything after you hear this. And then I says, if you can, you are allowed to leave this morning's worship with your mind made up that your belief is final and that the word of God matters not. Some may have already done that, but they're asleep in the light. I told him, you don't have to believe anything. I told him in that sentence, you don't have to believe anything I tell you because I'm not forcing you to hear anything. Point number one, why would the master ever delegate supernatural power to men? Now, because a lot of the fake preachers were telling you that they could heal you, you know, Benny Hens, Creflo Dollar, you're going to get it, everything you want, Fred Price, sickness is not coming near your house, and all that sickness came to his house, took him out. Whenever you make a statement about God, and then you end up dying, behind the statement that you said that would never affect you, people, are, the light needs to come on. I believe, and I mean this, because God knows that I'm not a materialist. Um, I bought the convertible Lexus convertible because I wanted a nice car once before I passed off this earth. I don't think that was a grave malfunction, I enjoyed the car when I drove it. And I'm glad that I took some money that I saved from cashing in on something to buy that car. But I never used church funds and church money to do it. That was my money that I bought that car. I turned in an SUV and gave the man $10,000 when I bought that sports car. I remember the church members would ask me, well, what does this mean? It means I wanted me a sports car, so I bought one. I live in America, and I can do that. I'm not living in a country where I couldn't afford it. If anybody else was like me and was here, they'd buy it too. It was the fruits of my labor. All right, but why would God ever delegate supernatural power to men? Firstly, it was urgent that the message of the kingdom was spread. See, Jesus came with the message of the kingdom, but he had to delegate that power and authority to apostles, okay, to spread that message. I know that through church history, that all these apostles and all these people weren't right. A lot of them delegated themselves to go. That's what happened in the American church. They delegated themselves to say this, to do that. God never said that. Secondly, missions was very high on Jesus's objective list. Jesus knew that the Jews would have the Romans crucify him and that he had but a short time 
And so he had to choose disciples to help carry the message. Because remember, the qualifications for being an apostle was that you had to be personally taught by Christ and uh, you had to uh, witness his resurrection. So that's why there are no apostles today and they never could be apostles in this era. When the church started calling everybody apostles, I knew that it was over then. I always taught the truth. Thirdly, men were to be the vessels that Jesus used from this time on. When you read that text, Luke chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, you see that. And yeah, I preach from this Bible because I have the verses highlighted. So when I preached this sermon in 2008, I preached from this Bible, delegated authority. Jesus still delegates certain authority to certain people to do, like me. He's delegated me to tell the truth about this book. I'm still alive. So I'm going to still do it. I'm not going to do it on the format that I did it before as a pastor because the church is corrupt. I don't want to be associated with buildings and, and boards of deacons and all of that stuff. That's corruption. That's corruption. You get like JMJ. You get in there so long because you saw me yesterday, the other day. I'm thinking. But when you're behind the pulpit, you can't do that behind the pulpit. You have to just give the straight exegy. But here in my study, I can parouse in my mind all I want to. Ah, I have to stay hydrated. And thank God for water. I hear it's getting hot all over the nation. It's starting to get warm here. Just keep the water flowing. Just keep, <laughs> just keep the water flowing. Huh? I'll be all right. <laughs> I got to hydrate. You give those babies some water in Texas because they're burning up in Texas now. All right, let's get back to this. This is interesting. I may just start getting these outlines and just going over them with you. I gave a lot of my sermon notes like this away when I taught homiletics and hermeneutics and all this stuff in my home. I'd have stacks of my sermons that I've already preached, and I'd give it to them and say, preach it. All right. So, does Jesus delegate today these powers to all believers? Now, that's a good question that I ask. See, because a lot of people that studied under me thought that God had called them to preach because they studied under me and they thought that I would ordain them. I ordained Sean Nelson. Greg Owens. And that's it. I only ordained two men. Sean Nelson, <coughs> who took over the Anselm Bible Fellowship after I resigned. I ordained him. I have a picture of his ordination. I'll put it up one day for you. And I ordained. Did I ordain Greg Owens? Yes, I believe I did. Those are the only two people. And as far as my knowledge, they're still alive. 
They may deny it, but I was there. <laughs> but the question is, and I, I wrote this question, does Jesus delegate today these same powers that he delegated to his disciples 2,000 years ago to believers? Point A, we must answer that question by asking another question like question, was every believer who came into contact with Jesus endowed with this supernatural power? Now, that's a good question, and I immediately took them to Scripture, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. I have the book here in front of me. I won't be able to finish this. I'm teaching you something. I'm, I'm teaching you that if you're going to talk about something, oh, I'm getting hungry. You know what? I got about four minutes left because I'm only going to go 90 minutes, so I better stop right here. But you see what I'm doing? When you prepare an outline for a discourse, and I preach, and every Sunday I preach, that's page one. And here's page two. And how did I end this? Conclusion. We as a church are called to do three important things. Listen to my conclusion. One, investigate the claim of any who profess their actions are those which are divinely authored by God. I said, question them. When they get up and said, I'm an apostle, and I'm this, and I'm questioning them. Don't just believe them. What are you believing them for? Secondly, be ready to deny an opinion when that opinion is solely based upon a lack of scriptural evidence. I'm saying, if he's up there yakking his mouth, or she's up there yakking her mouth, talking to you, and do not give scripture the way I gave scripture. Why are you listening to them? And thirdly, operate only in the authority of Christ that Christ has given you in order that his name and his glory shall surface. And if you don't do that, you're going to be swindled and taken advantage of. This sermon was found in this book. Wait a minute, let me find the right book. No, it wasn't this book, and it wasn't this book. It was this book that I had right in front of me. And I'm gonna put it right back in there and leave it there. Oh, wait a minute. I found something else. I don't know what this is. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Do you know what I just found? I found and sound Bible Church church program. Oh, my goodness. Here it is. It says, Anselm Bible Church into the Word Ministries, the biblical alternative, sola scriptura, that stands for scripture alone. Nothing else but scripture. John E. Coleman, pastor. There's my name, and so no one will trick you. I pastored the church. Don't get it twisted. I know who I am because they're going to lie on me when I die. They're going to lie. They're going to say, no, I did that. I did that. You know, they've been doing that ever since they got rid of me, uh, trying to steal my identity and take credit for doing it. Oh, my goodness. It has my website on here, had my email address, and everything. What did I preach from here? 
The theme was faithful trusting. And it was called Full of Faith, Saints Eager to Praise the Savior. James 1, 1 through 4. Oh, my goodness. And look at all of the activities. I'm going to leave it up there so you can see it a while. All found in this Bible. So whenever you and other things are found in this Bible too. I know I'm over the time. <coughs> you want to see something? <clears throat> I used to do these things. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I'm teaching you something. Oh, I remember doing this. Oh, yeah, this is, this is. I'm finding a plethora of works here that I had when people would come into the church. I'd show them this book and then this book here, and they'd go through it. It would have things that they could fill in, you see? They would fill in the things here. It was a beautiful life. None of it was dogmatism. It was all done in love. This is when they used to do church properly. But there's so much hatred of one kind of person against another kind of person. I don't blame a lot of gay people for leaving the church. I told them when they came to visit my church, they said, can gay? I said, I'll tell you a story before I go off the air. Julia was a young lady that was attending the church. She had gotten married since she was there. And she's probably still married to the man. But Julia would come by and visit Lucy and I after church on Sunday, and she would go back to church with us on Sunday night. And she wanted to go to church with me on a Sunday night. This is a true story. Listen, I'm teaching you something. There's a reason why I'm taking my time to teach you something. She said, Pastor John, I have my cousin and I want to bring him to church, but he's afraid to come. I said, why is he afraid? Ain't nobody going to hurt him. And she said, well, he's gay. I said, oh, he can come to our church. This was when my pastor was still alive. And uh, still uh, preaching. I said, he can come back to church. My pastor is not going to talk about no homosexuality. He don't do that. Because my pastor had to know that I was gay. Though he never had a conversation with me about it. But I told you, yeah, yeah, you can bring your... And if she's still alive and sees this webcast, she can verify everything that I'm saying is the truth. I don't lie. I, I, I don't know why I lied to you. Lying is stupid. It, it takes too much to lie. Take your blood pressure going up. Flip that. I'm not lying. So we jumped in my 1970 Toyota Corona, the green one. 
Lucy was in the front with me, with Delia. I think we had Delia. And, and, but anyhow, Julia was in the back seat with her cousin. And when I saw him, I knew that he was gay. I said, how are you doing, man? I, uh, you know, he came by the house and and I said, no, you can go back to church with us. Pastor Stanley's going to preach and it's going to be a nice time. So I sat in the audience with Julia and my family. And the pastor, I forget what subject matter he was on. He usually, the service was for an hour. He would preach for 30 minutes. Uh, I have tons and tons of notes from J.B. Stanley. But this particular night when he was preaching and he, and he all of a sudden starts saying, and you know, you got to be careful who you invite by your house because they'll mess your marriage up. And these homosexuals, this is what J.B. Stanley said, and these homosexuals, you got to be careful of them because, and I was shocked. My wife was shocked. I was shocked. The boy just dropped his head and started wagging his head. And I grabbed his hand and said, no, don't get him walk out. It's all right. I got this. And Jake went on and railed against him. And I saw how much it hurt that boy. And I knew Jake knew that I was gay. Albeit he never spoke with me about it because I had accepted God. And I was a Sunday school teacher. I wasn't touching them boys or nothing. I, I wasn't like that. I was a good guy. And that boy told me, he got in the car and he said, I told you. He'd do that. He told, I never go back to one of them churches. Do you know how that makes me feel? And I, 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 was, I was dumbfounded. I was angry. I didn't say nothing to my pastor. What do you say? Man, what do you say? The only thing that you can do is up and leave. How can you talk about that? Because he saw the guy was gay. And so he took it upon himself. And J.B. Stanley was from Tyler, Texas, a southerner. And he was a whoremonger. That's what he was. His MO was that he would go around and have sex with a man's wife. And he had once a guy after him with a gun because he did that. And so when he did that, I knew that I would never, ever in ministry ever do that. Gay people, homosexuals, whatnot would come to the church. I'd preach the way my outline is. That's what I would do. I would, I would never, never do that. All right, now let me clear that up. It's a true story. Did I ever confront J.B. Stanley about that? No. Because I know what he would do to me. I knew what he would do to me. So I said, I better keep my mouth shut. Because these church folk are notorious. And I had the gift of teaching. I taught Sunday school. I preached at other churches and did all of that. Now, I said that to say this. I'm teaching you something. You let me teach you people something. Yeah, I'm gay. But let me teach you something about God. Because all of us need God. All of us do. Those of you that are straight, you need God. There's a straight man today that called me and asked me to come and do his straight son's wedding. A straight man. You need to cut this foolishness out. And know that you're going to have gay people around you. They're going to be in your schools in your churches, on your job, everywhere. Get used to us. 
We are here. We are not going anywhere. We are smart as they come. We will forever be smart. We are not stupid. As men procreate and have children, many of them are going to be gay. And with that, I'm ready to sign out. Thank you for coming to my page. I'm teaching you something. God bless you. And uh, stop being judgmental. Embrace reality. Embrace it now.